Hello and welcome to this second recording of my presentation. Um, I made this presentation for our shearing today, January 30th. And today our topic was astrology and divination. And this has been a great passion of mine my whole life. And so I wanted to share a little bit about what I've learned during my time and hopefully inspire you to some big mind-blowing moments. Um, I started with these two quotes. So as the universe is expanding, um, it is important, I think, to share. And as somebody who's really fascinated and really in love with Hinduism and Indian tradition, there is this Indian version of the Bible, I guess they call it their Bible, or some people do, not everybody. Um, but the Bhagavad Gita has this quote, this is the wise man who knows the truth should not disturb the man of the mind of him who does not. And then I found this African proverb that says, if you educate a man, you educate an individual. If you educate a woman, you educate a nation. And so I've decided to go completely against the Bhagavad Gita. And in fact, really, I am here to hopefully blow your mind a little bit with this presentation. So welcome to this little chat. Now, when we talk about astrology, it's so interesting because most of us identify with our sun signs, right? So me, for example, I am in Western astrology, Pisces. So Pisces people are like dreamy, spiritual, a little bit like airy-fairy, maybe not so materially grounded. Um, so if you grow up thinking that you are your sun sign, you become what you think you are. You become a self-fulfilling prophecy when you see certain things in your personality you'll go well that's because I'm Pisces or you know like it's no point me trying that thing because I'm Pisces and I shouldn't be this I shouldn't be that now in an astrological chart your sun sign actually is how other people see you it's what you give out so when you actually read a person's chart, the sun sign is not necessarily the most interesting. There's other planets, there's other houses, there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on on the chart. But a lot of people don't know, right? We don't know better. So we become what we think. And so when you think that you are this one sign, you start to identify with only those qualities and then... Um, maybe to your own detriment, you leave other things on the wayside, or maybe you become a self-fulfilling prophecy of what you believe. Um, I want to talk about how the Western astrology is not even accurate astronomically. So Western astrology started, they created a map 1,500 years ago of the sky and then as the universe has continued to expand, this map has not been changed. What that means is that the planets are not in the positions that a Western astrologer will read. The map no longer fits the territory. Territory. The universe has expanded. The map no longer fits fits this territory the universe expands by one degree every 72 years since the count of western astrological charts 1500 years ago we have moved 23 degrees each sign in the astrology there's 12 signs has 30 degrees so the correct overlap now is only four degrees out of 30 that means that out of 30 days assigned to a sign, if you look at the Western chart, only four of those days still belong to that sign. The other 26 have moved into the next sign. So for example, Western astrology uses the first day of spring to symbolize new beginnings. On the Western system, it says that the first day of spring is when the sun enters the first sign of the zodiac, which is Aries. From that date, the rest of the planetary movements are calculated. But if you look up in the sky, the sun actually entered Aries on April 14th, 2020, not on the first day of spring, which is counted as March 20th. This is because as our Earth rotates, it wobbles and it expands, 
causing the sun to enter Aries at a slightly later date every year. The last time the sun entered Aries on the first day of spring was 1,500 years ago. Now this has all kinds of ramifications and implications for our understanding of time. For example, we have been talking over here in the West about moving into the age of Aquarius. Now, if we're looking at the actual astronomy, no friends, we're like, I think 300 years away in the actual astronomy of the sky. So the Vedic system counts or looks at the astronomy, not just this astrological map. They update their map to fit the actual planetary positions in the sky or in the universe. So if we say this another way, if you looked into the sky when you were born, your sun sign would you be in your Vedic or your Jyotish sun sign, but it might or may not be in your Western sun sign. There's a 13% chance that your Western sun sign, what you've been told that you are, air quotes, um, is 13% likelihood that that's true. 13%. What? So if you compare the Western system, the Vedic system makes a lot more sense because it actually relies on accurate astronomical principles. I think that if anything, you know, this 2020 year has taught us that it's very easy to tell a whole bunch of stories. And if you're fed up with just being told stories and you want to live a little bit more in reality, then welcome to the Jyotish system. The Jyotish Shastra is the oldest astrology in the world, one of them, could be, um, which is a system mentioned in ancient Hindu scriptures. So this is a tantric-based um, system. Jyotish means the science of light or heavenly bodies, and Shastra means the knowledge on the particular field. It is a great Vidya or spiritual science which is deeply embedded in a profound philosophy of life, and this great philosophy of life is what we call Tantra. The Vedic astrology is based on the concept of karma and moksha, which is uh, karma, as you know, is the action and the consequences of our actions, and moksha is um, the easiest way to express liberation, freedom from, from suffering, uh, salvation, or coming out of samskara, meaning that um, the eventual goal of the human soul is to be liberated from the rebirth cycle. In Vedic astrology, it is understood that the soul has to wait for a certain placement of planets to take place before it can be incarnated again. And this is uh, depicted in your Kundali, which I'll get to in a second. So let's do some comparisons just to see the differences being the between the two. So Vedic astrology can be traced to the Vedas, the first uh, foremost scriptures on the planet. Vedic astrology was developed by ancient seers and rishis of the Indian subcontinent thousands of years ago, sometimes around eight to 10,000 years. Vedic astrology is pious and antique and believed to be the word of God passed on to the wise people in the past. Now, another thing um, that I really feel that I'm learning more and more about is the importance of looking for information within, which is a more feminine way to uncover the truth, which is to listen inwardly. If Western astrology um, is linked back to Greece and the Egyptian civilization, which is a lot about the intellect and the mind, and so this is about rationality, about logic, uh, it's a more masculine tradition and as I said this tradition has got itself stuck in time because they created a map they've stuck with the map even though space has changed so um, yeah stuck in time air quotes the Vedic astrology system is about a fixed zodiac with a certain nakshastra or planet in the background it's also known as the sidereal zodiac the sidereal year is the time it takes by the earth to revolve around the sun with respect to the fixed star Chitra. And this duration is about 20 minutes longer than the tropical year. The tropical year is what we call the Western astrological year, which is based on the orientation of the earth to the sun. 
Vedic astrology or sidereal, the, the sidereal system is a moon-based system which covers all areas of life. The sun changes its sign in a month, around a month, and the moon actually changes its sign every 2.25 days. So if you do predictions based on the moon, they're more close and accurate because our moods and our circumstances change frequently. So again, if you look at somebody's chart and you see that everybody born in March, um, well, end of February to March, are Pisces in the Western uh, system, and we only focus on um, people's sun sign, then everybody born that month would be perceived similarly. Whereas when you look at the moon sign, then the people born in March, every 2.25 days, they're a different type of inner being. Moon calendars, moon cycles, all of that is more feminine, more feminine energy, more about this inward sense. So if you look at your moon sign on your chart, your moon sign will be more about your inner experience, so how do you see yourself. Um, again, the sun sign is how you, the energy that you project outwards. Western astrology relies more on the movement and the placement of the sun. Our calendars over here in Europe are sun-based calendars, um, emphasizing more on psychology, personality, and the character of the individual. Moon would be more on the emotional side. Vedic astrology is based on our karma. And it's very important to note that in Vedic astrology, your rising sign is considered more important than your sun sign because your rising sign is where you're going. Also, in Vedic astrology, you are not a fixed being. You can um, tremendously impact your character, your life, through making conscious choices. So when you go to a Vedic astrologer, they can advise you on... Um, for example, certain types of meditations or certain mantras or certain diets that can enhance um, or affect, positively affect your personality based on your chart. Western astrology is more psychological um, and is more mythological because it is not necessarily based in reality. So in Jyotish, your natal chart is called your Kundali. And those of you who know a little bit of yoga, you'll recognize the root of this word as Kundalini. There's another interesting concept in uh, your Jyotish chart. So if you see, there's an example of what a chart looks like um, on the right of this slide. And in your chart, you'll find yoga. And a yoga in your chart is a special combination of specific planets and how they relate to each other. This is something that is unique to Vedic astrology. When you have a yoga in your chart, there are certain planet signs or astrological aspects that come into um, alignment that create specific types of um, traits or specific types of dharma, which is your kind of life purpose, the way you live your life. So you have a couple of different types of yoga in uh, a person's chart. One is the uh, Raja Yoga, which is an auspicious type of yoga to a specific aus auspicious alignment of planets that will mean this person will be very successful in business or in their career, for example. Uh, Dana Yoga in a chart will mean this person has a great combination of planets and stars, uh, planet signs and uh, aspects to create wealth and prosperity in their lifetime. And if you have a sannyasa yoga, that means that you have come into this lifetime to be more of a student, more of a spiritual uh, focus in your life rather than necessarily like becoming a parent or um, making money. You might be more interested in connecting with the spiritual side of things. So hopefully this has given you a little taste and hopefully this has got you to become more interested in the universe. Um, the next slide, I have taken out the names of the women who joined for the talk today. Um, but I just want to use the slide just to illustrate this is based on the reading or the, yeah, the readings that I did for people's charts. So if you look here on the first row, it's me. My, I left my name there. So in the tropical or in the Western system, my sun sign is Pisces. 
but in the Vedic system, I am in fact Aquarius, and I've put times three there because I actually have quite a lot of Aquarius in my sign, in my chart. Um, more interesting then is my Vedic moon, which in Vedic, uh, my moon is Taurus. Incidentally, in the tropical system, my moon is in Gemini. And my ascendant, which is the most interesting in the Vedic system to look at, is in Sagittarius. The last column of this chart, I have um, looked up just which planets are the ruling planets and which de uh, deities are the deities that are the most connected with um, the person or the chart. Sorry. So for me, the planet that is like my ruling planet is Jupiter. And the deities, I didn't put both of them down here, but it's Shiva and Durga, which those of you who know me will know that that is absolutely the way it should be. Um, and then A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, the women who attended uh, today's shearing. So just going through it, for example, Lady A, her tropical sun is in Cancer, but her Vedic sun is in Gemini. But then as you can see, her Vedic ascendant is in fact Cancer as well. So even though her sun sign has changed, her ascendant sign is her cancer. And this lady really identified with cancer. She felt there was a lot of connections with cancer. And then look, her ascendant is in cancer. So there is that uh, similarity. If anybody else um, is interested to find out more, like I said, I'm super happy to talk you through it. I'm super happy to have a look at your chart and give you an updated, more accurate reading of... Um, who you really are, <laughs> if um, if this is ringing, you know, some kind of ding, 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 like interests, uh, touching your truth chord a little bit. Um, I don't really have that much more to share right now because the next slides are a little bit more personal for the women who attended today. But I did want to mention before um, pressing pause on this recording that our next shearing is on Thursday, the 11th of uh, February and we're going to continue definitely on Zoom um, depending on what else happens uh, the Zoom will always be a part of this if we can meet up in person then that's great but even when we do meet up in person I'm going to keep it available for those who want to join via Zoom so that both options are possible um, on Thursday the 11th we're meeting at 6.30 and we'll finish around 9.30 and we're going to uh, meet to celebrate the new moon. We're going to talk about grief and motherhood. And our dress code will be to dress up as Mother Earth. The following session will be on Saturday, March 20th from 11 to 3 p.m., which is when we celebrate spring equinox. And as you've just heard me say, spring equinox in the Western system is celebrated on March 20th, but in actual fact, um, spring equinox is a little bit later on in the year. It's in around April 14th, uh, in fact. But anyway, we'll celebrate according to the Western. So we're going to talk about money and abundance uh, in March. In April, we're meeting on a Tuesday and we're celebrating the super moon that's happening. And we're going to celebrate also Hanuman, the monkey god, and this is a great time to talk about body image. In May, we're meeting on the 26th, which is a Wednesday, again in an evening. This is a day where we have a supermoon and a lunar eclipse. We're going to talk about porn and masturbation on the same day as actually happens to be the Buddha, Gautama the Buddha's 2583rd birthday. And um, this topic has been suggested by Lydia, and Lydia will provide us with a presentation this day. And the dress code is going to be to dress as a porn star. Uh, looking forward to that. In June, we're meeting for Summer Equinox, and again, Summer Equinox in the Western system, which is on the 20th of June. And to celebrate the Summer Equinox, we're going to talk about the fear of other women. In July, we're meeting on a Saturday in the afternoon and we're celebrating Guru Purnima, which is a special holiday in India, holy day when they celebrate the Guru, the great teacher. And this day, we're going to talk about personal relationships, both to other people and to the divine. As in India's traditions, we understand that all others are God in disguise. In August, 
We're meeting on a Sunday and we're going to celebrate the Jayanti of Gayatri or the rising of the light force, of the victory of the light forces. Uh, Gayatri is the first of the goddesses and she is the goddess of sunrise. And we're going to talk about the topic of forgiveness. In September, we're meeting on autumn equinox and we're talking about abandonment. This is a topic that was suggested by Natalie. In October, we're meeting on a Wednesday and we're going to celebrate Durga, which is my favorite goddess, the warrior goddess. And we're going to celebrate the victory of light over darkness by exploring the topics of boundaries and personal guilt. In November, we're meeting on another supermoon, which also happens to be a lunar eclipse. <sighs> Big energy that day. And the topic is going to be codependency. And the last shearing of 2021 is happening on Saturday, December 4th, which is a solar eclipse. And the topic is to come out of our comfort zone, shamanism and the wisdom of the unknown. So with all of that said, I really look forward to sharing more with you this year. And um, for those of you who attended today, we set a mantra for ourselves for 2021. Um, the mantra was just one word uh, at the end. The first two words are I am, and you're allowed to put max three words after the I am. So if you've listened to this whole presentation, I would love you to just indicate that you've heard me all the way until the end. If you don't feel comfortable to send your I am mantra on our shared group, then please send me to me privately so that I know that you heard me all the way to the end. My mantra for this year is I am ready. And from this place of readiness, I am really grateful to you for having listened, for having given me your time and attention, your most precious resources. I love you. Thank you.